All righty. Good morning, lads and ladies. Welcome back to Calc 2. I'm going to go ahead and close the door here. Keep noise down. And we can get started. So you now have a feel for infinite series. Hopefully, at this point, you've solved a handful of problems related to each of the convergence tests that we've learned. What I want to do today is, is a few things. Um, I want to get you some more practice, of course, uh, working with the convergence tests that we have learned so far. And I want to try and help develop your intuition a little bit uh, regarding infinite series and what it means for an infinite series to converge. <clears throat> and we're also going to loop back and talk a bit about sequences vis-a-vis um, -vis this thing called growth rates and uh, what, what I'm going to refer to as the Landau notation or the double less than notation, um, because the, the kind of high level way of thinking about infinite series um, involves understanding how fast various sequences grow. And, uh, and so I, I want to expose you to those things and give you some new tools for thinking about um, sequences and series now that you've had a, a bit of time to play with them. Uh, finally, <clears throat> I want to um, prepare you for the material that's coming next. So the next few sections um, will be dealing with series where the terms are not necessarily all positive. Uh, you may or may not have noticed that an hypothesis in each of our convergence tests, except for the test for divergence, is that the terms of the series are positive. Um, and of course, there are many series where not all the terms are positive. Uh, most series do not have exclusively positive terms. So um, it turns out that can fuck with stuff in some really weird and surprising ways. There's a, there's a very good reason why we begin talking about series with positive terms. Um, the moral of the story here is that infinity is a strange animal. Uh, it took mathematicians well, thousands of years to wrap their head around the notion of infinity in any sort of rigorous way. The first man to do it uh, was a man named Georg Cantor, and I'm actually going to provide you with one, of, one or two of his theorems today. Um, so let's get to it. This is MAC 2312. The section number is 004, which means we're talking about Calc 2. Uh, and today is the 22nd of October. 2021. So today, practice with our convergence tests. Um, intuition behind Intuition behind convergent versus divergent series. Um, something called growth rates. Functions. Uh, more specifically, sequences. Remember, sequences are functions. They're just functions whose domain is whole numbers. And then maybe a, an introduction to section 11.5 on alternating series. OK. So practice with convergence tests. I think maybe the game there would be to uh, take a few homework questions. I trust that if you guys have been looking at the homework, you have questions. So um, let's start with that. Are there any particular problems from this or the last homework set uh, that you guys would like to look at more closely, having a hard time with? I'd like to, to focus on 11.3 and 11.4 stuff. But if there's an 11.2 problem there, we can look at it as well. Maybe I'll grab one for you while, uh, while you guys peruse. Start with something easy and then work up a little bit. Any of these are done. That's kind of a fun 
המון. Yeah, let's start with number seven here. Okay, so for the next 10 minutes or so, I'll take problem suggestions, whatever you guys want to work, just write it down. I'll put it in the chat. So here we have three times the square root of n over one plus three n to the three halves. I realize I'm asking you to multitask. I'm asking you to uh, tell me what problems you want to work, but I'm also going to ask you some questions about this. So if you know that you're not going to be, you know, digging through the homework set looking for problems you want to ask about, um, maybe you can tell me whether you think this series converges or diverges and give me some ideas to why. Don't be intimidated here. I promise you, everybody is feeling just as lost as you are. And this conversation is how we're going to fix it. I think it's more likely to converge here. OK. Uh, why is that? What is it about the series that gives you that feeling? Uh, I think the um, piece of the degree on the denominator is higher than the degree to the numerator is what I'm basing it off of. This is a good start. Yeah, this is a good start. So everybody heard what Augustine said. The fastest growing term downstairs here is n to the 3 halves. And the fastest growing term upstairs is n to the 1 half. So the denominator grows faster than the numerator. Uh, that's very true. That's very true. Uh, <clears throat> and that will provide for us one or two things that, that are worth looking at. Um, if the denominator grows faster than the numerator, what can you tell me about the limit of the ANs here? So forget about the series for a minute. This is kind of leaning towards the test for divergence. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the ans, the terms inside my series, is the limit as n goes to infinity of, I'll write it as 3n to the 1 half over 1 plus 3n to the three halves. Yeah, very good. Because the denominator grows faster than the numerator, uh, this limit is going to be zero. That's, that is true. Um, arriving at that conclusion, one way you could do it is to divide top and bottom by n to the three halves. So rather than using L'Hopital's rule, because I don't think the L'Hopital's rule here is going to be especially pleasant. Although it might shake out, um, I, would, I would do this. You've got non-integer powers, so there's no hope of differentiating one of them until it goes away. If I divide top and bottom by n to the 3 halves, I use that renormalization trick. I still have my limit n to infinity. Upstairs, 3n to the 1 half times 1 over n to the 3 halves is 3 times 1 over n. And downstairs, I get 1 over n to the 3 halves plus 3. Let me make some parentheses here to make clear what's the big fraction, what's the little fraction. Remember, the reciprocal of any positive power will go to 0. So this is going to 0, and this is going to 0. So we're going to get here 3 times 0 over 0 plus 3, uh, which is 0 over 3, which is 0. And 
the reason why this limit comes out to zero is Augustine's observation that the denominator grows faster than the numerator. What does it mean? Uh, what have I learned from this theorem, the test for divergence, based on the fact that the limit of the AMs is zero? What is the output from that test now that we've found this limit to be zero? Good, very good. So Richard's got it in chat there. This is inconclusive. The series could converge or could diverge. And this is probably the, the most persistent misunderstood thing in all of these sections that we've talked about over the last week. Um, the limit of the ANs being zero does not guarantee that the series converges. Um, it could go either way. If the limit of the ANs is not zero, then the series must diverge because you're adding up a bunch of stuff. It, that stuff needs to get small, right? If you're going to add infinitely many things together and get a finite number out, then those things need to be getting very, very small. Um, but getting small is not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, what is sufficient and is kind of hard to quantify is that they need to get small very, very quickly. So let's just poke around with our intuition a little bit. An here, which is three root n over one plus three n to the three halves, if I ignore all of the kind of trivial parts here, like this one, this is very similar to 3n to the 1 half over 3n to the 3 halves. And when you divide n to the 1 half by n to the 3 halves, and cancel the 3s, of course, you get 1 over n. Um, and that's that's this piece that we're seeing upstairs here, right? That's why that's what shows up there. So one over n does go to zero, but the question is, does it go to zero fast enough that when I add up all those terms, the series would be finite? And this is a question we are now prepared to answer. In other words, based on this, I'd like you to revisit the question. Do you think the series converges or diverges? Well, does the series sigma 1 over n converge or diverge? Yeah, sigma one over n is a divergent p-series. Here, p is equal to one, which is not strictly bigger than one. So I suspect that our series which I'll just refer to as S, so I don't have to write the whole thing, diverges. That's my suspicion. So the test for divergence doesn't get me there. That test is inconclusive. But intuitively, just kind of thinking about the terms that are most significant, um, I suspect that this series diverges because it's quite similar to the sigma 1 over n series, the harmonic series. And this is good, right? This is really where you want to get started on most of these problems. It's just kind of asking yourself, what do I think is going on here? 
because most of these series, especially at this point, are sort of gently disguised versions of either P-series or geometric series. All right, we're not throwing ultra crazy shit at you at this point. We're just fucking with a well-known series a little bit to, to force you to think uh, that much. Um, so I would say more valuable here than the test for divergence, which didn't teach us anything, is this intuition. And it, it's very concrete, right? It's not, I'm not like just waving my hands in the air and saying this looks like one over n. I'm saying this one downstairs really isn't significant compared to 3n to the 3 halves. This piece grows way faster than this. In fact, this piece doesn't grow at all. So based on this, we suspect that my series diverges. But you are now at a point in your mathematical careers where a suspicion and the right answer is not sufficient anymore. You need to prove that this series diverges. Now there's three things we could try to do here. We could try to do an integral test. We could try to do a direct comparison test, or we could try to do a limit comparison test. Those are the options. The integral could you test. Do a limit comparison test? Yeah, yeah the... very good. Very good. So, Enrique's suggestion for a limit comparison test is the way to go. Why not a direct comparison test or the integral test? I guess the limit comparison test, due to that we have an AN and a BN, we could do the limit between. This is fine, right? Yeah, so I know that my AN is quite similar to 1 over N. So, I've already got a really good candidate for a limit comparison test. If I wanted to do a limit comparison test, I would try to use BN as one over N because I think that this guy is very similar to my guy. The other issue here with a direct comparison test is that if you try to build the natural inequality, so um, we will prove this. with the limit comparison test. Uh, now, having a thing to compare with is, is a, an important thing for both the limit comparison test and the direct comparison test. I'd like to really quickly say um, the direct comparison is hard here because the natural inequality, or easy to come up with, it points the wrong way. It's, I could say, okay, three root n over one plus three n to the three halves. On the one hand, this, as, as n goes from one to infinity, this is certainly positive. Uh, and, because this denominator has a plus one in it, that makes the fraction overall smaller. So this thing is smaller than three root n over three n to the three halves, which is one over n. Now, why isn't this useful? I can say that the terms of my series are smaller than one over n. Why is that not helpful? Because the original series is smaller than one over n, and we know one over n diverges, but that doesn't tell us if the original series converges or diverges. Perfect. Augustine nailed it. Being smaller than a divergent series doesn't tell me anything. If I'm smaller than one over n, uh, that means I'm smaller than something infinite. I could myself be infinite. I could also be finite. Being smaller term for term than a divergent series doesn't tell me anything.
because being smaller than a divergent series doesn't force my series to converge or diverge. Right, so it's all about the logic. You need to be thinking very carefully about the logic. If you're smaller than a convergent series, you must be convergent, right? Because if you're smaller than something finite, you got to be finite. On the other hand, if you're larger than a divergent series, then you must be divergent. Because if there's something smaller than you, which is infinite in size, then you must also be infinite in size. But if you're smaller than something that is infinite in size, you might be infinite in size as well, just a bit smaller, or you could be finite in size. It could go either way. So limit comparison is the right choice, like Richard said. And the reason why limit comparison is the right choice is because the sort of easy to come up with inequality here points the wrong way. If my guy was bigger than one over n, if this inequality went the other way, then I'd be Gucci. I'd say, OK, I'm bigger than the harmonic series. The harmonic series diverges, so my series diverges. But that's not what we get. And it may be possible to construct an inequality where this guy is bigger than some other divergent series, but I don't see it right away. I don't think it's going to be easy to come up with one. So the correct approach for this series is a limit comparison test. And after our little you know, intuition discussion there, where we recognize my series is quite similar to the sigma one over n series, you could jump straight to this. All right, that, that is uh, all we need to know um, what to pick for Bn. And then we compute that limit. The limit of the AMs over the BNs. This is limit n to infinity, three square root n over one plus three n to the three halves divided by one over n. And I know you guys are Calc 2 students, I shouldn't need to say this, but please be careful with your fractions. All right, remember division is not commutative and it's not associative it's a weird operation so the parentheses really matter you need to understand like what's the big fraction and what are the little fractions how do i resolve this limit what would be my next like algebra step The big fraction multiplied by n. Yeah, we're going to flip and multiply, right? So I'll have 3 root n over 1 plus 3n to the 3 halves times n over 1. All right, you flip the bottom. I'm taking this numerator and dividing it by this denominator. So we're going to flip this guy and bring him upstairs. Now 3 root n times n is 3n to the 3 halves, right? Root n is n to the 1 half. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. And downstairs, I still have 1 plus 3n to the 3 halves. And there's a bunch of ways to see that this limit is going to be 1. If you try to plug in infinity, you get infinity over infinity. So I think my fastest path here is probably a little loopy tall. We get lim n to infinity, 3 times 3 halves, n to the 3 halves minus 1 is 1 half divided by 1 differentiates to 0. We get literally the same thing, 3 times three halves n to the one half and everything cancels. So we're taking the limit as 
is n goes to infinity now of the constant one, which is just one. Am I done? I'm certainly done with the limit. Am I done with the problem? Yeah, if you read this, what story would you tell yourself? What would you say in your head to wrap it up? The fact that this limit came out to one tells me what? That the uh, both equations would um, converge or diverge together. Yeah, very good. The two series in question, since L equals one is positive and finite, it follows from the limit comparison test that the two series sigma n equals one to infinity, s equals sigma one to infinity, three uh, root n over one plus three n to the three halves. And the series I'm comparing with sigma n from one to infinity, one over n converge or diverge together. And I wanna pause here to talk about a common mistake. A lot of people, when they get to this part of the, the problem, don't write the sigmas. They don't write this, and they don't write this. They say this thing, three root n over one plus three to the n have, uh, three n to the three halves, and one over n converge or diverge together. That's not correct. And I know it seems pedantic, but it really is important because without the sigmas, you're talking about sequences. We're not talking about sequences here. We're talking about series. So I'll say this. Um, please, when you get to this part of a limit comparison test, make sure you write the sigma here, okay? It is actually important. It's not just me saying it's bad notation. It's me saying, if you don't write the sigma, you're talking about something else, which is not what we're talking about. So remember the limit comparison test tells us that two series converge or diverge together. And without the sigmas, you're not talking about series, you're talking about sequences. So the output from the limit comparison test, since this ratio, a n over b n, has a positive and finite limit, the series sigma a n and sigma b n converge or diverge together. And I'm still not done. We need to wrap things up finally by saying, moreover, the series sigma n from one to infinity, one over n is a divergent P series. Because P is equal to one, which is not bigger than one. Thus, our series S equals sigma n from one to infinity, three square roots of n over one plus three n to the three halves must also diverge. All right, so there's the full solution. I'll zoom in down here a little bit. So. And the words at the end are probably the most important part. Well, I don't say that, but the words at the end are crucial, right? Without, without explaining what's going on, that calculation has no meaning. You've just taken a limit, that's great. But what we wanna know is, does the series S converge or diverge? So your last words here should always be, the series converges or the series diverges. Right, any questions on what we did here, how we did it, why we did it?
Okay. There was a question in the chat. Um, is the exam next Friday? I don't think I've set a hard date for the test yet. Um, but let me give you a, a little bit of insight into uh, where we're going and when. So that we need to work through 11.7 before the test. Um, and the syllabus does have us doing that in week, oh, it's a week twice here, it's a copy paste error. Syllabus does have us doing that next week and it's possible we'll get there, but I don't think so um, because we haven't talked about alternating series, absolute convergence or the root and ratio test. So I think we're about a week behind. So most likely your exam two will be not next week, but the following week. And probably towards the end of the following week, maybe the fifth or the third, something like that. Um, but I will let you know when we get closer. I'll release the study guide a week before the test. Um, so you, you'll have plenty of notice, I promise. Just please continue watching the lectures. I will, I will not let the exam creep up without talking about it. OK. Last call for questions on this problem. Something funny about these. We knew this motherfucker diverged like right away. And then the first five minutes of talking about the problem from this intuition. So if there's one skill that will save your ass more than anything else in this class, this. Yeah. On the test, would we still have to show like our conclusion like about the P series and then going into the comparison test? Oh yeah. Oh All yeah. Right. So this this block right here. Yeah. Generally, we do this in our head. I, I'm writing it out because I'm trying to share it with you guys, and I want you to have time to, to deduce it. Um, but this is generally something we do in our head. You can write it down, of course, if it's not immediately obvious to you. Um, but a solution to the problem doesn't actually begin until we get over here. So uh, I don't know if any of you guys have the time to like read through that full Reddit post that I sent uh, following the exam one. But Calc 2 is basically a, we call it baby analysis, right? So this work with sequences series, the whole concept of convergence and divergence live in the branch of mathematics called analysis. And what I'm required to teach you to do is to write what are essentially little proofs here. So when we run this limit comparison test and we write these words at the end, what we're doing is proving that our series is divergent. Uh, looking at the series and being able to tell whether it converges or diverges is very good because it helps us write that proof. But a full solution to the problem, um, indeed any solution to the problem, uh, has to amount to a proof. So you need to go through the logical steps to deduce that the series diverges. And you'll see that there are some series that really evade your intuition. In fact, I'd like to look at one of those next. So I gave you a problem or two to work at uh, last time at the end of class that was not in your homework. Let me look at one of those. This is actually the harder of the two. The two series were this guy and um, this guy with the, the nth root of two minus one raised to the nth power. Um, the other one, uh, I have a convergence test that you don't know yet, which will answer that question very, very quickly. And I'll share that convergence test with you next Wednesday. Um, but this one we can handle now, uh, even though it is the harder of the two. Um, in other words, this is, this is the, the more awkward of the two series because it's, it's less to work with here. Did anybody play with this at all? It's okay if you didn't, I know you're busy. But I'm just curious, did anybody have a chance to play with this? Yeah. So one of the things, um, one of the tools that's nice to play with is um, looking at the graphs of the partial sums and the graphs of the sequence itself. I have on here 
uh, what I, I call the log plot of the partial sum. Um, and this guy uh, it makes it easier to see if the partial sum is going to infinity or not. Um, I'm going to turn him off now so we can just focus on focus on the objects in question. Okay. So the purple is the terms of the series, an, the things we're adding up. And the red is the capital nth partial sum. So remember, if the capital nth partial sum has a finite limit, that's what it means to say that the series converges. In fact, let me turn off the terms of the series also. So I'm just trying to tell whether this red sequence here is convergent. And for the particular example I have in at the moment, it looks like it is, right? We're increasing concave down. It kind of looks like this thing is approaching some finite limit, which would mean that the series, sigma a n, right? This is the formula for the partial sum of sigma a n, means that that series would converge. And here you, you see, right, 1 over n to the 1.2, that is a convergent p series. Right? The a n's here are 1 over n to the p. So the series sigma a n would be a convergent series. But what happens if I put our guy in here? So 2 raised to the 1 over oops, 1 over n to power minus 1. This also looks like it may converge, right? This series is about as hard to tell as they get. And if we follow this partial sum way out, he kind of grows like a logarithm. The growth is incredibly slow, and it is the same increasing concave down behavior that we often associate with convergent sequences. Uh, but you'll notice he doesn't appear to be bounded, right? He appears to be growing just very slowly, but he never like really levels off. He just keeps going up and up. He goes up more and more slowly. Um, so it's very hard to get a, a feel for whether this series is going to converge just looking at this. It looks like it might. But if you track it out far enough, this thing will eventually get over any horizontal line you throw in there. So in other words, I claim that this is a divergent series. I gave you a hint. Does anybody remember the hint for this series? Think about the derivative of a n. Yeah. Why would I want to think about the derivative of the ANs? <laughs> what does the derivative of a, of a function in general tell you about the function? It tells you the slope, right? The slope or the rate of change, which is how fast the function is growing or decaying. Well, that would mean then that I want to differentiate the function or the this expression two to the n, or sorry, two to the one over n minus one. Does anybody know how to differentiate two to the one over n? We talked about this a little bit last time. Uh, no, no need for a natural log here. Well, I mean, natural logs will show up, um, but there's no need to like take a natural log. So remember, the derivative of b to the x is b to the x times the natural log of b. So by the chain rule, if u equals u of x, so function of x, then 
So a derivative of d to the u would be d to the u times the natural log of d. That's the derivative of the outer times u prime. So this is by the chain. No, oh, I said by the chain. Oh, no, by the chain. So the derivative of 2 to the 1 over n is 2 to the 1 over n times the natural log of 2 times the derivative of 1 over n. Why is this useful? Well, 2 to the 1 over n, as n goes to infinity, this gets very close to 1. Right? 1 over n goes to 0. 2 to the 0 is 1. The natural log of 2 is a constant. So this is very similar to the natural log of 2 times the derivative of 1 over n. In other words, a n grows or decays at about the same speed as 1 over n itself, right? The derivative of my a n's is equal to or approximately equal to a constant times the derivative of 1 over n. So if two functions have the same derivative, they grow or decay at the same speed. So I cannot make a direct argument using the algebra saying that this thing is very similar to 1 over n. That ain't going to work, right? Just like our last problem, we said this thing is similar to 1 over n, so probably does the same thing as 1 over n. But I can say that this thing's derivative is very similar to the derivative of 1 over n, which amounts to the same result. If my thing grows at the same speed, or in this case, decays at the same speed as 1 over n, then the series made up of those things probably behaves about the same as the series 1 over n. So since sigma n from 1 to infinity 1 over n diverges, I suspect that sigma n from 1 to infinity and root of 2 minus 1 diverges. And that is the correct answer. But it's not a solution. A solution has to amount to a proof. So again, a limit comparison is going to be the thing. And again, I'm going to pick the n to be 1 over n. This just happens to be the case that these kind of fun, challenging examples uh, that I had readily available um, are, are ones that are nice to compare to 1 over n. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the a n over the d n is the limit as n goes to infinity of I'll write it as 2 to the 1 over n minus 1 divided by 1 over n. Uh, another way to say this, the reason thinking about the derivative of the a n's is nice is I'm looking forward to L'Hopital's rule. Right? I'm, I'm imagining using L'Hopital's rule within the limit comparison test. I know that the a n's go to 0. I know that this passes through the test for divergence, no problem. 2 to the 0 minus 1 is 0. So I know that this numerator in this limit is going to be 0. And if I have any reasonable choice for comparison, then the denominator has to be 0 as well, because the ans and the bn should be quite similar. So I know that this limit is going to be a L'Hopital thing, which means I'm going to be looking at the derivative of the ans. Hence, starting here. 
Uh, like I said, this is zero over zero. So I'm gonna hit it with some what we call zero. I, I told you guys the story behind what we call zero, right? He stole this shit. Like he bought it off of Johan Bernoulli. That's kind of funny. Uh, the derivative here we've already computed. This is t to the one over n times the natural log of two times the derivative of one over n. And then downstairs, I just have the derivative of one over n. If you want to be supremely lazy, you don't even need to take the derivative of one over n. I can just say this part will definitely cancel. So this is the limit. n goes to infinity of two to the one over n times the natural log of two. which is two to the zero times the natural log of two, or one times the natural log of two, which is just the natural log of two. Now, in order to finish things, remember uh, this thing, which we've been calling L. In order to get a positive or useful result out of the limit comparison test, I need to know that this number is positive and finite. Do I know that? How big is the natural log of two? A little less than E. Um, it's a little less than the natural log of E because two is a little less than E. What is the natural log of E? A little less than one, basically. Yeah, very good, very good, yeah. So this is a little smaller than one. Um, just like you guys all know the first few digits of pi. How about this much? Can, can, I, can I ask you to remember this much? It's about 0 0.6, 0 0.69. Everybody loves those digits next to each other, right? Not too hard. Um, it, it's positive and finite. And the positivity here, we really should be concerned about because the natural log does throw out lots of negative numbers. The range of the natural log function is negative infinity to infinity. Yeah, in fact, let's, this will help us remember, right? Nice. Um, so yeah, natural log of two is a positive and finite number. Uh, thus, by the limit comparison test, The two series my series s equals sigma n from one to infinity n to the two minus one and sigma n from one to infinity one over n converge or diverge together. Moreover, we know that sigma n from one to infinity, one over n is a divergent pieces. So t equal to one, which is not bigger than one. Thus, s diverges. Also. Um, I know there's a lot of writing here, and I know that uh, it's not necessarily pleasant to write the same shit over and over and over again. So I will give you some tricks to kind of cut down on the amount of space that you need to take up on the page. One of those tricks, which some of my colleagues don't like letting their students use is to abbreviate the tests, right? Writing out the words limit comparison test over and over again aren't especially fun. You may have caught me abbreviating the test for divergence as TFD. If you want to call test for divergence TFD, the integral test IT, direct comparison test DCT, limit comparison test LCT, I'm fine with that. 
if you're going to use those, right, if you're going to use acronyms for the test, make sure you get them right. Because if, if you give me some three letter acronym that doesn't correspond to any of our tests on the exam, I'm going to be like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Another place you can save yourself some time. I did it down here, but I didn't do it here. Uh, if you give the things that you're playing with a name, and the homework doesn't always do this for you, but if you choose to call the series you're playing with by some name like S, then instead of writing out the whole series each time, you can just write S. So it would be a, a valid edit here to replace every instance of this thing by just the letter capital S. Uh, those are really the only two tools I have for shortening this stuff. Everything else you kind of you kind of need to write. But it'll feel natural if you practice it. Any questions on what we did here? So yeah, just just to make sure, if we look at the series and nothing comes up to mind of uh, similar um, other series, just find the derivative and go from there. It's not a bad idea to look at the derivative of the ANs. Yeah, that can be helpful. Um, I will be giving you some convergence tests down the road that are very mechanical, that don't require you coming up with a comparison. Um, and a lot of people will jump to those tests if they don't see something to compare with right away. But those tests will fail on this series. So it is a skill you need to develop. And yes, looking at the derivative of the ANs is a good idea if you don't see anything else. Um, this would also work for that sine of 1 over n series that we played with, right? Because the derivative there is cos 1 over n times the derivative of 1 over n. So again, based on that, we could conclude that the sine of 1 over n decays similarly to 1 over n itself. Or we did 1 over n squared. So sine of 1 over n squared decays similarly to 1 over n squared itself. All right, um, this is a pretty nice lead in to the other thing I wanted to talk about here, which is the um, intuition behind convergence and growth rates. So um, let me share with you some things that I have found helpful. Any question? What features? of the sequence AN um, hint at the convergence or divergence of the series sigma and from wherever to infinity of a. Oh, there's several answers here, right? And the first one is, is really your test for divergence. I've said it, so let's write it down. The an must go to zero. as n goes to infinity or sigma n from one to infinity a n to have a chance at conversion. Right, and this is exactly what the test for divergence says. It says if the a n's don't go to zero, then that series doesn't have a chance. Why? Well, let's come back over here. Let me take some sequence that doesn't go to zero, like like this. And let me plot the sequence a n along with the series sigma a n. So what's going on here? Well, the sequence AN is converging to the number two, right? The purple dots 
very quickly get close to the number two and stay close to the number two. What that means is, as you add up more and more terms of the series, you're just essentially adding two plus 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 two. So the partial sums are exploding. If you add two to itself over and over and over again, that's going to get really big. So if the sequence an does not go to zero, the series sigma an has no chance of converging. It must diverge. And that is exactly what TFD says. But we know that going to zero isn't enough. This isn't sufficient for the series sigma n from one to infinity an to converge. Think about one over n. This is a counterexample. So what is it about, what is it that one over n doesn't do that one over n squared does do? Why does the series sigma one over n squared converge when the series sigma one over n diverges? What do you notice about the blue and the red? The blue here is one over X. I'm sorry, the red here is one over X and the blue here is one over X squared. They both go to zero, right? If you look way out here, both of these graphs get close to zero. Very good, Richard again in chat nails it. It's that the blue goes to zero much faster, right? So the, the Y values on this graph are going to zero, just like the Y values on the red graph, but the blue graph is settling down on that horizontal asymptote much, much, much faster. And if you compare this to like a geometric thing, it goes to zero faster still. He'll actually swap places with the blue a few times, but if you get in here, you'll see that the green goes to zero even faster. So the thing is, it's not just going to zero. Going to zero is necessary, but not sufficient. What we need is for the an to go to zero very quickly so one over n compared to one over n squared is a good example And for series of positive terms, this is pretty much the whole story. For a series of positive terms to converge, we need those terms to go to zero quickly. And to that end, I want to talk about growth rates. You could also say this is talking about decay rates, but normally we, we do it like this. So first, a little definition. We say that an is less than less than bn. Also said an is little o of bn for my computer science people. That's the Landau notation. We say an is less than less than bn if the limit as n goes to infinity of an over bn. Think about what this should mean intuitively. It should mean that an are a shitload smaller than the bn. Well, if an is a shitload smaller than the bn, 
then an over bn, that ratio should be very, very small. And in the limit, we get zero. An alternate notation. which is used heavily in computer science, is we say an is equal to little o of bn. So there's a big O notation and a little o notation. Um, this isn't a zero, this is the letter o. And we read this as little o. So we say an is little o bn. It's the same thing as saying an is less than less than bn. I think the less than less than notation does a better job of conveying what's going on. It says the ans are a shitload smaller than the bns. But these, these mean the same thing. And if you're in computer science, uh, you'll see a lot of this. The other one is big O notation, which means an is approximately a constant times bn. Uh, we also use it in number theory. My, my branch of mathematics, the old school number theorists use this like a Riemann. Okay, why is this notation useful? Well, I want to talk about how quickly sequences grow or decay. Theorem. For positive numbers, Um, P and Q, and I might add some things to this list. Any power of the natural log will be less than less than any straight up power function. So any power function where the power is positive will dominate any power of the logarithm. And regular power functions, uh, yeah, P, Q, and B greater than one, these will be dominated by any growing exponential. which itself is dominated by the factorial. Factorials are really fast growing. And that factorial will himself lose out to what I'll call the super exponential, n to the n. Uh, this is a very useful tool when it comes to uh, just developing intuition about how fast things are growing. So for example, one of your series from the 11.2 homework, you had e to the n over n to the 5, right? Or e to the n over n to the 7. This piece right here is all you would need to tell me that that series diverges. Even if you had like e to the n over n to the 1 million, this right here would tell you that that series diverges because e to the n is much, much bigger than any power of n in the sense that when you divide n to the 5 by e to the n, the limit is 0. So if you're to divide in the other order, e to the n divided by n to the 5, that would go to infinity. Now you can take reciprocals everywhere here and flip over the less than, less than. So this is kind of a, a nice way to think about how fast uh, various sequences grow and uh, hence how fast their reciprocals decay. So 1 over n to the n goes to 0 a lot faster than 1 over n factorial. 1 over n factorial goes to 0 a lot faster than 1 over 2 to the n or whatever. 1 over 2 to the n goes to 0 a lot faster than 1 over n squared, goes to 0 a lot faster than 1 over the natural log of n to any power. Uh, refer back to this from time to time. Just look back at it and see if you can't recognize your problems in this context.
Got your homework up already, right? Let's look at one or two more comparison test type things. See, a lot of these 11.3 problems can also be done with the comparison test, but let's dig a little deeper. <sighs> How's about? Yeah. We've done a couple things like this. Maybe. Did that one. Let's look at number 22. It's easy to get the feeling that we should always use the limit comparison test. But the limit comparison test takes a while. What do we have downstairs? Four to n minus seven. The disadvantage of the limit comparison test is that it, it does take some time, right? You have to compute a limit. There's more to write. Um, so when a direct comparison is viable, uh, I encourage you to, to try it. Does anybody see what we might want to compare this with? The ans here are five to the n plus one over four to the n minus seven. Which is five times five to the n over Four to the n minus seven. What's the dominant term in the numerator? Five n, five yeah. to the n. Yeah, the five to the n, right? This is constant. This grows like hell. And the dominant term downstairs is four to the n. Again, this is constant. So this guy reminds me a lot of five to the n over four to the n, which is five fourths to the n. In other words, I suspect my series is quite similar to the geometric series sigma five-fourths to the n. I suspect S diverges since it's similar to sigma n from one to infinity five-fourths to the n which is a divergent geometric series, right? That's a geometric series with a common ratio of five fourths, which is bigger than one. Now I could get there with a limit comparison. We absolutely could, but my lazy ass wants to do a direct comparison because I see the inequality right away. And I want you guys to start seeing the inequalities right away also. Is my guy, my five to the n plus one over four to the n minus seven, bigger or smaller than this guy? Would it be bigger? Yeah. My numerator is bigger than the numerator of five to the n over four to the n, right? It's five times bigger. And my denominator is smaller, right? Because I've subtracted seven. So here we go. Zero is less than or equal to 
five to the n plus one over four to the n minus seven, um, at least eventually, right? Maybe for n equals one, this is not true, but for n equals two, it is, and onward. And this is less than five fourths to the n, because the numerator is bigger and the denominator is smaller. Right? So either one of those things on their own would have done it. If you've got the same denominator and a bigger numerator, oh shit, I wrote, I'm so stupid. I'm sorry, guys. I wrote these inequalities the wrong way. Um, let's do it like this. Because five to the n plus one is bigger than five and four to the n minus seven is less than four to the n, we see that five to the n over four to the n is smaller than five to the n plus one over four to the n minus seven. I'm so sorry, I wrote the inequality on there. And of course, this thing is positive. All right, so bigger numerator makes you bigger, smaller denominator makes you bigger. Therefore, since sigma n from one to infinity, five to the n over four to the n is sigma n from one to infinity, five fourths to the n is a divergent geometric series with absolute value of the common ratio being absolute value of five fourths, which is five fourths, which is bigger than one. It follows from the inequality star that my series S sigma n from one to infinity, five to the n plus one over four to the n minus seven must also diverge by the direct comparison test. Okay, so the terms of this series are bigger than the terms of a divergent geometric series. And geometric series, when they diverge, they diverge fantastically. They, they blow up so fast. Uh, so if you're bigger than a divergent geometric series, you definitely diverge. Okay, let me turn on my timestamps here. See where we're at. Ten forty-four. I want to, in parting here, um, fuck with your head a little bit. So I, I mentioned that when you play around with infinities, things get kind of weird. Fun fact. Sigma n from one to infinity, one over n squared, which is one plus one fourth plus one ninth plus one sixteenth, and so on. This is a convergent p-series. We know that. Uh, does anybody know the sum of this series? I think I mentioned it once. Two. That would be nice. Um, not, uh, that's the so the geometric series one over two to the n converges to two. Uh, this guy in fantastically weird fashion converges to the number pi squared over six. 
Uh, this is called the Basel problem. It's a famous problem in mathematics. Uh, Basel, the city, um, is, is named after, and the man who solved it was Leonard Euler. Uh, the famous Euler of the number E and all of those other things that, that we loathe in pre-calculus and slowly come to love in calculus. And the way he did it was by representing the sine function as a big infinite polynomial and then comparing some coefficients, kind of like we do with partial fractions. It's, it's hard, um, and a, it's not something I'm going to do or make you do in this class, but it is a fact. Um, and the reason I, I mention this now is because this is hugely counterintuitive. You see, if you add two rational numbers, like one and one fourth, or one fourth and one ninth, or one fourth, one ninth, and one sixteenth, you always get a rational number. This is weird because a rational number plus a rational number is always a rational number. But here, we have a bunch of rational numbers adding up to the very irrational number pi squared over six. Uh, your textbook has a few problems relating to this fun fact. Um, that you might want to look at. They're in 11.2, and it's just like, you know, okay, well, what if I summed from three to infinity? What would that add up to? And that means, okay, you just delete the first two terms. So you subtract one plus one fourth. Um, other ways that infinities can be funny is if you rearrange um, certain series. So another fun fact. If I take the sum sigma n from one to infinity, I have to think about this for just a second, um, negative one to the n plus one over n, which is one minus one half plus one third minus one fourth plus one fifth and so on. Uh, this adds up to that natural log of two. So again, rational numbers adding up to an irrational number. So same similar weirdness, but this gets even worse. See, the terms of this series are not all positive. And the way that this series converges is counterintuitive. Um, the basic thing that's going on here is like a one over n, which we would think diverges. But because every other term is negative, it's kind of canceling itself out. It's almost like a telescoping series. And what's worse I can rearrange the terms of the series above a bunch of different ways I can rearrange it into two divergent series That would be sigma n from one to infinity, uh, one over two n uh, plus one, uh, zero to infinity, one over two n plus one, minus sigma n from one to infinity, one over two n. Uh, this guy. If I take all the odd terms, the one plus one third plus one fifth is this guy. And if I take just the even terms, one half minus one fourth, so on, that's this guy. And you can show that both of these diverge. So this is uh, an example of that thing we talked about where a uh, sum of two divergent series might be a convergent series. I can also rearrange it into a series which converges to any real number I want. So 
So pick your favorite real number x. I can reorder the terms of this series, not changing any of them, just reordering them so that the series converges to that number. Yeah, basically. This, is, this appears to violate a fundamental rule of arithmetic, which is that addition and subtraction of real numbers is commutative, right? You can add numbers in whatever order you want, and it should not change the outcome. The take home lesson here infinity is fucking weird. The only reason any of this weird stuff can happen, like adding rational numbers to get an irrational number, or having something that looks like it should be finite be infinity minus infinity or any other real number I choose, I could also rearrange this series so that it just straight up diverges without splitting it up. Um, uh, the, the lesson there is that infinity is very strange, and uh, I encourage you to Google the following things. Oh. First, the name, Georg Cantor. Uh, Georg Cantor is a famous mathematician, first guy to really try and wrestle with infinity in a serious way. Uh, these facts right here that you can rearrange a series like this into divergent series or a series that converges to whatever real number you want is called Cantor's derangement theorem. And um, the documentary Dangerous knowledge. You see, these things were being discovered around the turn of the 20th century, um, which happens to coincide with the discovery of quantum physics and these kind of uh, non-Newtonian phenomena that are very, very counterintuitive. And, uh, and they go against what was believed to be true about mathematics and physics for centuries, millennia even. I mean, we like to think that the real world is 100% consistent and uh, you know everything kind of works like a big machine or a little machine, right? If you scale up a, a, an R-sized machine, um, you should get a machine that obeys the same rules. Or if you take an R-sized machine and scale it way down, you should get another machine that behaves you know, according to the same rules. Uh, neither of those things are true. And the kind of mathematical version of that discovery in physics uh, has to do with Cantor and issues with set theory. So kind of the foundation for all the mathematics that we have done in this class and you have done in all of your previous math classes is something called uh, zermelo frankel set theory. And that is uh, the closest thing we have to a complete axiomatic system for mathematics that is consistent with um, the old school way of thinking. But it turns out that ZFC is weak shit. Um, there are many, many problems in mathematics that are seemingly easy to state uh, that are undecidable in ZFC. Uh, one of the famous problems that people suspect might be undecidable, but it's still not known, is um, the Riemann hypothesis, which you may have heard, uh, says something about the function, the Riemann zeta function, and where its roots are in the complex plane. Uh, a famous problem that is known to be undecidable, there's two great examples here. First is the continuum hypothesis, which says that, OK, so uh, the real numbers are infinite, right? There's infinitely many real numbers. The natural numbers are infinite as well, right? There's infinitely many whole numbers. It turns out that the infinity of the real numbers is strictly larger than the infinity of the natural numbers. That a little counterintuitive, right? Okay, they're both infinite, they should be the same size, but no, there's different infinities. It gets worse. Um, the infinity of fractions, right? Rational numbers, fractions made up of whole numbers is the same as the infinity of whole numbers itself. So even though between zero and one, there's infinitely many fractions, if you take all the fractions and all the natural numbers, they turn out to be the same size, but the real numbers are strictly larger. The continuum hypothesis was first posed by Gerard Cantor, and he said, is there a set that is bigger than the natural numbers, but smaller than the real numbers? And he worked on this until he killed himself, um, went quite crazy and killed himself. 
And we learned years later that this is uh, undecidable in ZFC. You cannot answer that question using set theory uh, or any mathematics based on set theory. Uh, another good example is the halting problem. Uh, my computer science people have maybe heard of Turing machines before. It's kind of an archetype of a computer. Uh, if you take a, a perfect computer and you feed it an arbitrary program, answering the question, will this program ever stop, is not something you can do based on the code. So it turns out that the code um, is itself not sufficient to answer the question, will a computer stop running on this program? Will it ever spit out an answer or, or will it just churn on and on forever? Of course, some specific things you can answer, right? If the, if the program just says print hello world, it will print hello world and then stop. Um, but in general, there is no general analysis you can do on code that will tell you whether a computer stops. And that is, uh, again, an, an undecidable thing in set theory. Um, so yeah, math can get a little weird. Um, math is for the most part, not weird. I want to be very clear about that. A lot of people get really hooked on this idea and they kind of give up and write this feeling like my life is a lie, totally understandable. Um, but don't fall all the way into that trap. Uh, don't, don't be canter. Um, the vast majority of mathematical questions are decidable. The vast majority of problems do have good concrete answers. And what we want to do as, as mathematicians is um, find answers to those questions. So we want to discover theorems and prove them. And the vast majority of them you can prove. Um, but there are questions out there that are very hard to answer and some that are impossible to answer. And I, it all has to do with this kind of weirdness uh, with infinities. And I, I'm just very happy to be in a place where I can share that with you. And if you want to explore that because it's not a part of this class, I encourage you to, uh, to watch this documentary. It's on YouTube for free. Um, it's a really cute documentary and it doesn't just talk about math, it also talks about Leo Boltzmann and the discovery of entropy and a few other things. And if you find that at all interesting, uh, one of the characters discussed in that documentary is this man, Gerard Cantor, um, a beautiful human being, tragic story, but he um, is the reason that we have the beautiful mathematics that we do today, together with the rigor that we need in order to make sense of it. So that's where I'm going to leave you guys for today. Next time, we're going to talk about alternating series. This is an example of an alternating series and a convergence test associated with those. And then we'll talk about the root and ratio tests. Um, those will be the last real content on exam two. Uh, but then there's one more section, 11.7, that we're going to discuss before the test, which is like a strategies for testing series thing. Uh, so we're about two weeks from the test. Uh, please work hard on the homework. If you need help with anything, come see me in office hours. Don't be shy about this stuff. Uh, I know the tutors are not always the best at this sort of thing. You're kind of getting to a place where, where they're going to struggle too. So uh, try to be patient with them. But remember, it's still worthwhile to ask. And uh, anything that you can't get from them, I'd be happy to help you with. So that's it. Take care, gang.